Good evening and good morning to everyone. Thank you for joining us at this webinar on public-private partnerships for sustainable development. Uh, we wanted to remind you that the registration for Habitat 3 is open. Uh, we invite you to register for free at our webpage uh, www.vivehabitat3.ec or in the UN page which is um, www.habitat3.org. Um, uh, registration is open until October 1st. We will begin this webinar with a short introduction by a representative of Ecuador's Ministry of Urban Development and Housing. Then we will proceed to the seminar on public-private partnerships for sustainable development given by Dr. Darin Corinne Namblard. After that, we will have a short one-question survey and we will proceed with a Q&A section. You can ask your questions throughout the seminar in the chat window and we will answer them at the end. Uh, now I introduce to you Cristina Gomez Jurado from the Habitat and Human Settlement Secretary of Ecuador's Ministry of Urban Development and Housing. Good uh, morning and good evening, everybody. Uh, the Ministry of Urban Development and Housing of Ecuador has been working for the last years in the construction of national urban policies that will help change the urban development model that has created unsustainable urban development and that has fostered inequality in our cities all over the country. In this context, important events such as Habitat 3 provide us with a unique chance to start the conversation and debate over what kind of cities we want and what should we do to to build them. We are committed to the principles such as the right to the city, the social, the social function of land, and to the idea that living well in the city should be for all and not only for those who can afford it. All of these principles included in our constitution and law, however, it's not enough to have them written down if we don't come up with the strategies and means that to implement them. We believe that in a country where more than 70% of the people live in cities, we can no longer delay the national debate on these issues. We have found that hosting this important international meeting has awakened the interest in city planning and management in universities, architects, engineers, stakeholders, and the community in general. And this is a chance we mean to take full advantage of. Making cities better will be a huge effort. <coughs> And one of the biggest challenges we face as a country is that the fastest growing cities are small and intermediate ones, precisely the cities that lack human and financial resources that will make good city planning and management possible. In this context, the ministry is working very hard to provide cities with enough means to face the problems of fast urbanization, especially with national and legal frameworks and training programs that will strengthen their capacities. We believe that making cities better is a collective effort. And we are pleased to begin the cycle of webinars that will that make part of a bigger context of national urban debate that we hope will help us as a country in the construction of a national urban agenda and for more equitable, inclusive, and prosperous cities for all. This ninth webinar on public-private partnerships for sustainable development will introduce the concepts of PPPs and will provide a discussion on why these partnerships are needed and what makes PPPs successful and how they can contribute to advanced economic growth and sustainable development. Dr. Corinne Namblard will instruct this course. She's a senior PPP expert and advisor at the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe. Dr. Corinne holds a master's degree and a PhD in political science from the University of Paris, Nanterre, obtained a master's degree from uh, Middlebury College in the United States, and pursued a doctoral studies at Harvard Kennedy School of Government. Holds an, exec holds an executive, executive management diploma from HEC, CPA in Paris, France. Dr. Corinne, your presentation can start now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good morning to all. Good afternoon to all. Um, look, uh, maybe uh, first of all, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to share with you um, some of the learning because um, as was um, said, I come with a private sector background actually. Um, I have been a, an investment banker and um, have also been managing a uh, for for more than 10 years a private equity fund uh, dedicated to infrastructure and as such um, I have served as a um, uh, an expert um, in in uh, in infrastructure uh, you know with the World Bank uh, the European Commission um, I have chaired uh, for the UN uh, over the last 15 years uh, you know the, the the shift from 
different types of contracts to PPP contracts. I have been involved in the designing of the PPP law in France, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But um, the reason I have accepted um, this invitation is that um, we share uh, with Unitar. Uh, actually a same passion and a same vision about uh, uh, promoting uh, what we believe in and uh, private-public partnerships is a uh, an interesting subject it is the subject of uh, a lot of uh, uh, comments um, and we need to demystify things a little bit and I think this is a, a, a really interesting opportunity um, to uh, to question uh, to question engage into uh, this discussion you will see in the back I have uh, put um, uh, the uh, announcement uh, of the, the special poster uh, for Quito Abita 3 uh, and I am uh, quite interested in, in seeing that uh, this new conference uh, is going to be promoting a renewed you know global commitment to sustainable urbanization with all its challenges and uh, it is and, and private public partnerships you know might be one of the subjects um, during the conference and I think that um, in order to be better prepared for such a discussion I think it's interesting that we, we, we talk about it a little bit more so my first comment would be that you know the word sustainable is being used you know for everything a sustainable this sustainable that um, it's the new buzzword um, and actually just like PPP it means different things to different people uh, and I have tried to look at it, you know, from a 360 degree perspective, um, you know, what is it that we're expecting? So um, SDGs is um, the 17 sustainable development goals as per the uh, UN 2030 agenda. It is an integral part of a remarkable document called uh, the AAA, the Addis Abeba Action Agenda, and I highly recommend, um, you know, the reading of, of this particular document. And on the private side uh, or private sector side, uh, Global Compact, uh, who is spearheading um, this uh, initiative, you know, with the private sector, they're promoting the SDGs under uh, 10 principles. So fundamentally what sustainable means is as a focus on planet, prosperity and people. And I guess it, it is all about the future that we want. Uh, and it actually truly means that when you do the 360 degree, whoever is involved in these discussions and in these partnerships, um, the focus ultimately, you know, should really be on people's needs. And I think the government, um, uh, Christiana, has has actually highlighted this: is that uh, we we need we need to um, you know collectively think uh, better and approach this uh, slightly better. So let me just give you a few. Um, minutes of why the UNECE and obviously uh, you know UNITAR feel empowered about uh, promoting PPP. Uh, not only have we done this historically as I said you know for the last 10-15 uh, years but under you may know that SDG 17 is about partnerships it says partnerships um, and uh, in the Addis Ababa agenda the AAA it is under uh, action 48 and it says uh, very clearly and I'll read it out um, we recognize that both public and private investment have key roles to play in infrastructure financing um, blended finance instruments, including PPPs, serve to lower investment specific risks and incentivize additional private sector finance across key development sectors led by regional, national and sub-national government policies and priorities and priorities for sustainable development. So this is where, you know, we find legitimacy in engaging into this discussion, um, um, you know, with yourselves. And if I read from the same document, um, urbanization, the new urban agenda is actually uh, priority 12, delivering social protection and essential services for all. And in particular, in the action areas, it's under um, section 34. It talks very clearly about um, the fact that um, we commit to scale up international cooperation to, strength, to strengthen capacities of municipalities and other local authorities. Um, we will um, enhance inclusive and sustainable urbanization and strengthen economic, social and environmental links between urban, 
peri urban and rural areas by strengthening national and regional development planning within the next national sustainable development within the context of national sustainable development strategies and finally it says in the end of the paragraph in these efforts we will encourage local community participation in decisions affecting their communities such as improving drinking water sanitation management etc etc by 2020 we will increase the number of cities and human settlements adopting and implementing integrated policies and plans so you know as you will say okay these are all very nice words but this is actually the context within which we will all have to operate and I think the this webinar um, opens uh, an interesting opportunity, as I said, on the merits of PPP. You know, are PPP um, an interesting tool and lever to uh, actually meet the objectives, these very challenging objectives set by the new urban um, agenda? PPPs, uh, you know, come under different names and acronyms. Um, sometimes it's P3, sometimes it's called concessions or PFIs. And um, they're not always uh, understood, nor are they uh, perceived positively in, in, in most instances. Uh, in some countries where I've actually worked, uh, you know, PPP is almost, it's not a four-letter word, but it is almost a four-letter word. And um, it is associated with full-out privatization, which actually, ideologically, is absolutely not acceptable in certain countries and certain governments and sometimes for historical reasons uh, and probably most recently for uh, a demand you know coming from the communities and basically saying well no this is this should not be in the hands of the private sector solely you know governments we the people should have a say in you know um, how these uh, partnerships are being structured but we cannot allow ideology to just kill or not allow uh, the the proper use or leveraging of an interesting tool because PPP is a tool it's nothing else it is a tool we'll come back to that and let me give you a little bit of a historical perspective because people think of this as just something new but it isn't new it's been you know around for centuries and the very first um, uh, examples of PPPs uh, are to be found in the Roman uh, the Roman Empire where special uh, legal frameworks were actually developed for roads road construction public baths as well as the management of markets so clearly for urban uh, uh, means then a little bit later in medieval Europe and in particular in France a number of very interesting uh, water channel projects and roads and railways um, you know were using concessions or delegation of the you know uh, uh, delegation by the public of a public service to the private sector and interestingly enough there have been a lot of trials and errors um, and these different sorts of partnerships and concessions have developed within different legal systems and we'll come back to that because the nature of the legal system has a lot to do with um, whether um, you know the PPP was ac accepted or not fought over for ideological reasons we'll come back to that more recently and probably more of you have heard about the PFI uh, the public uh, you know the private finance initiative which is quite well known, um, you know, widely used in the UK and the Netherlands, and together with the PFI uh, acronym comes along VFM, value for money, uh, or public sector, you know, comparators, etc. Well, all these notions are uh, quite interesting, uh, and 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 the reason I'm giving you this perspective is that. They have all been, you know, interesting steps uh, taken in creating a transparent, and I'll come back to the word transparent, but it's quite transparent and replicable, um, you know, framework. So it's on that basis that, um, you know, PPPs have been able to develop and profit because do you current do you know that currently there are more than 10,000 PPPs in China? 
Now you'll say, well, Corinne, maybe you know the definition of PPP in China is not exactly the definition we have in mind, and we'll come back to that notion of definition. There are thousands of PPP in France, for example, um, but there were only last year, in 2015, sorry, 16 PPPs in developing countries, uh, in nine countries for approximately four billion. So we have to, you know. Uh, uh, take into account the fact that PPPs maybe are not what they seem to be. And I will start by saying what PPPs are not, and then we'll focus on you know, what PPPs might be. As I said, it's not a panacea. Uh, it, you've probably heard that word before, but it is true. It is not the only response. Uh, to a government's um, temporary or more permanent economic difficulties or lack of funding uh, to do projects. In the best of days in the UK, uh, when the PFI concept was being promoted, only 16%, 1-6% of all public procurement projects were done as a PFI. So once again, you know, only 16%. PPPs are not a free lunch. Um, they're not off-balance sheet um, and should not be considered as off-balance sheet transactions. Um, it is not the best way of mobilizing or the only way of mobilizing private finance in lieu of public funding. Um, and it's not a catch-all label for collaboration you know, between the private and the public sector. I think it's important that we 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 keep those you know these issues in mind as we address you know what are actually PPPs. The challenge, as I said earlier, is that even the experts do not agree as um, uh, a good what is a good definition of PPPs. Um, the OECD experts recently came up, and I'm, I'm, I, I take part in some of these. Um, you know, groups, and they say there is no widely recognized definition of PPPs. Other institutions, uh, such as Eurostat, EISB, IFRS, all work with different definitions, and some academics um, talk about at least 25 types of, of PPPs. So it is quite confusing, as I say, even for um, some of the experts and some of the people who have to uh, manage the accounting side and the legal framework and you know the, the structuring of PPPs. I personally would like to offer the following definition. Um, I think PPPs, private public partnerships, actually fill a space between the traditional procurement, you know, government procuring projects, and as I said, most of the projects ever done are done by public procurement. So PPPs fill the space between that traditional procurement and a full privatization. And as you can imagine, there's a whole range of opportunities, you know, within that space. Um, so, and it, and it is also a reminder that PPP is another form of procurement. It's not, you know, something else. It is another form of procurement. So that you see that uh, beyond the terms of what we call procurement contracts, you may find other things such as short-term, you know, management contracts, or I said, you know, a public service, or an outsourcing contract, if it makes sense, concession contracts, uh, or joint ventures between the public and the private sector. So, again, a proliferation. And I would like to indicate that there's been an interesting study that has been done by one UN body called UNDESA, and uh, they have some, in the first part of this document, they have some interesting documented academic research on, you know, what uh, PPP is and the different forms of PPPs. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, I'm not sure I share some of their conclusions, although, you know, I, I do agree with them that uh, maybe there needs to be more of a focus on what is, you know, a proper definition for PPPs, but I personally continue to like the fact that Partnerships, especially now with the SDGs, are going to allow us for a new definition of PPP, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to come to that. For me, um, so we've talked about you know what PPPs are not. Now, some of the um, probably accusations 
and comments that you have heard about PPPs is that PPPs are more expensive than you know traditional government procurement. And yes, it is a fact. It, it, it is more expensive for um, a series of reasons. If a private sector uh, company funds itself on the market, it's going to be you know more expensive than if a government goes um, directly for you know some market funding. But a lot of these um, these short these analysis or comparisons made between you know the cost of funding of the PVP versus the cost of funding of the public procurement does not account for a number of key parameters. And one of the parameters that is invariably missing from the evaluation sheets is the time factor. Because if a government in the priorities of projects that it has uh, says, well, I'm going to prioritize project A over project C, and if the project C can actually be done under a PPP scheme in the generic sense of the word, then from a timing perspective, the government allows that project to come online and if you compare you know, a T0 situation with a T1 or T2 situation, then instead of having just one project, which was going to be the original uh, uh, you know, traditionally procured project, then you now have a second project, which is actually going to be generating revenues, tax revenues, et cetera, et cetera, for the government. So a number of times, the, the time impact is not measured correctly. As I said, timing uh, and providing a new you know, infrastructure or essential service project to the community, i.e. two projects versus just one, and the time factor of the tax revenues and other benefits that are derived you know, from, for the state, you know, from that second project which has been done under a, a PPP structure. So, PPP has also ha has to be measured as as a catalyst, and I think that um, now uh, you know if we if we if we focus when we will be focusing on SDGs, I think the time factor and the impact on the community is probably a much more important uh, for me criteria and measure criteria and reporting criteria than just the value, uh, the money value of this. And it's a complex issue, but we can come back to this. Second issue is uh, people said, oh, you know, the, the, there's, no, there's no project, uh, there, there's no money. Um, you know, everybody talks about the funding gap, the infrastructure gap. You know, the buzzword is, oh, we need trillions. We'll never close the gap. Well, as a financier, I can simply tell you and assure you that money is not the issue. There's more money available. Uh, currently than is necessary. But um, why is it that this money cannot be deployed? And I think we, we need to, to come back to this. And at this point in time, I'd like you to have one particular, um, follow me with this particular consideration. And again, it was, um, it was presented um, you know, a number of times, but most recently and most eloquently by the uh, Secretary General of the OECD, Angel Guria. And he said the following, he said, you know, right now we are in a no growth, you know, world economy. And we can no longer accept the fact that there is a two or three speed, you know, type of economies. And basically the larger economic, the, the larger economies, the, the developed countries actually need, you know, the developing countries need, you know, their own demands for essential services because it is a question of survival also for the larger economies where they suffer from a no growth scenario. And if you speak off the record to a number of, you know, developers, infrastructure um, uh, companies and so forth, they will agree 150% that this is a, a question of survival. Um, now, as I said, there is money and there will always be money for the big, big projects because they're the most iconic. Uh, people want to be involved in those projects and whether they take place in developing countries or, and or developed countries, these projects will get the funding. I'm talking about, as we were you know, uh, mentioning earlier and this whole um, discussion is obviously within the, the next Quito um, uh, urban, new urban agenda. 
uh, I'm talking about smaller projects. I'm talking about the uh, uh, the essential projects um, and that are part of this new urban agenda. And even though you know people tend to say, well, small is beautiful. Small is actually small projects are difficult. They're difficult to finance because they require the same amount of due diligence time, uh, closing time. And um, because of their complexities, uh, if they are not part of a of a of a well um, you know a, a well known framework, uh, you know a, a number of the private players you know won't touch them. So the focus, and I think it's really important that I share this with you, is that the focus of the international community and the private sector as well, and as well as the uh, UNEC, has been um, on streamlining and trying to frame and provide a, a framework that would be acceptable by all parties to um, develop a pipeline of small and large and you know medium-sized pipelines of well-prepared projects. The notion of well-prepared actually appears in the Addis Ababa Action Agenda, but this had been worked out or worked upon by the private sector for a while. And there's a remarkable platform that is coming. Um, it's, it's been announced a few months ago, but it's um, and there is capacity building. And um, I believe that um, ICE has actually been to Ecuador, but certainly in the region, and we will continue to, to promote it. It's called SIF-IISS. And this is a platform, so I recommend you go to the website of sif dash IISS, and you have a look at what this platform is going to uh, provide. It is um, allowing uh, government officials, because it is a tool for uh, governments, to actually um, help prepare projects and present to the investor, uh, investment community a well-prepared project. And all the questions will lead actually to uh, um, uh, case, you know, projects that have uh, a certain um, a certain level of information, which is absolutely um, critical, you know, for for funding. But what is really interesting is that as this is being done, um, it is also a, a learning tool, uh, a capacity building tool for government officials. And I have, uh, on behalf of the UNECE, been in charge and, and I have developed and helping develop a specific template which is going to be SDG compliant um, you know PPPs and the reason is again to put forward um, as a as a learning tool put forward what does it mean to be SDG compliant what does it mean to be you know to offer the opportunity of doing a, a project under a traditional public procurement or a PPP structure. And all these tools are meant to actually get everybody at the same sort of level playing field. The reason I'm insisting on this is because once you have projects that meet a certain number of criteria, then you can package them. And small projects can now, you know, they're all being packaged and they, they can be presented, um, you know, um, to long-term investors and um, we can we can probably um, derive some funds from the traditional sort of funders into these projects. But the good news, the really really interesting news, is that the focus uh, on PPP, on SDGs, on essential services, is now hitting the radar screen of a whole new range of investors, not just the you know traditional investment banks and commercial banks and the MDBs you know, the, the, the regional development banks and the World Bank and the like. These projects are now on the radar screen of um, the impact finance community. And I don't know if you know about the impact finance community, but it is billions and it is under the radar screen. A lot of people have not heard about them, but the really interesting thing is that if you start looking, and I'm, you know, once again, because I'm in Switzerland and, and, and the Swiss um, um, have published information about what they do um, as, a, as a community of investors, I will recommend that you look at the Swiss Sustainable Finance Foundation, Swiss Sustainable Finance Foundation, and you will find some remarkable statistics. 
as I said, we're talking about billions that have been invested in uh, impact finance. But what is more interesting is that do you know that small, you know, urban projects, school projects in countries where a number of banks will never ever go, and I'm talking about Uganda, for example, are actually generating market returns in the long term that are better than, you know, investing in treasury bonds, um, you know, in the government of, uh, 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 you know, U.S. government or the French government. Why is that? Because the projects are managed in the hands of very capable people, people that have local teams on the ground. Um, I'm talking here about, for example, Blue Orchard that has considerable knowledge about, you know, how these schools are managed. And there have been very few um, bankruptcies or, you know, so the timeline is a lot longer than the traditional, you know, project finance and, and, and PPPs, but the returns are there. So what I'm trying to put in perspective for you is that we need to have a new angle of attack, a new focal lens when we talk about um, uh, PPPs and the the need to actually focus on this new criteria as uh, you know SDG. So when I talked about PPP and PFI and value for money, I think we have gone beyond that. It's not value for money. Um, it's no longer the measure uh, for me of a successful PPP. For a long, long time, it was, you know, the value for money. No, I think the new value is going to be value for the people. And once again, you know, I'm a, I'm a private sector, um, a financier, and I'm not saying this because, you know, it's, it's the buzzword and it's the way to look at things. No, it is actually, it makes good business sense. And I think that a number of players are realizing that by refocusing on, SGG, people, planet, prosperity, and taking a much longer term and a new angle of things, it's actually a win-win. And I think it's really important as we put PPP in perspective with the Quito UN Habitat 3, is that we have all these notions in mind. And I'm sorry because I'm going really fast over some of these things. But um, as a paradox, you know, um, uh, PPP has always been, has always, uh, you know, the private practitioners will say suffer uh, a lot of scrutiny, but uh, I think that um, the, the, because it is, it is outside of the traditional public procurement, it's obvious that um, more scrutiny has to be applied when you look at a PPP. Uh, and we're current, I'm currently right now working on the new UNEC standard on transparency and integrity. And we agree that, you know, because the PPP is just different, um, it, it, it offers also different points of entry of, an, you know, unethical behavior and possibly corruption uh, um, uh, opportunities. And so we are fully cognizant and, and we know that, um, you know, we, we, we need to apply more scrutiny. But I think that beyond the, the, the need for scrutiny in terms of, you know, the, the rules and regulations. I think that SDGs are now inviting to the table in a new role, what I call civil society and people. Not that they were absent, uh, you know, from former um, uh, PPP consultations, but they were peripheral i.e., uh, you know, people were consulted or, you know, civil society uh, um, taken into account in the upstream cost-benefit analysis, for example. But they were never called at the table. They were never part of the discussions. Uh, we as the financiers, you know, were always trying to, when we were, um, you know, uh, testing uh, the feasibility, the economic feasibility of a project. Sometimes we were testing, you know, the cost of um, the, the the passage of a bridge compared to, you know, a kilo of apple. Uh, we were just trying to imagine, you know, the 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 the, the resilience of the economic model, um, you know, and 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 the pricing of a particular. Uh, a particular uh, service that was being offered, you know, compared to what people could afford or, or could not afford. Um, 
and and sometimes we're awfully wrong. And and I think that you know governments learned um, you know the hard way the fact that if you don't communicate upstream, if you don't involve people upstream, then the community sometimes uh, takes things in its own own hands. Um, I can remember being involved in the construction of uh, you know this major bridge uh, in Portugal. And uh, on the day of the opening, uh, the Portuguese government had to send in the tanks because people were opposing, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, toll barriers and tariffs. They just basically said, well, we need to go, you know, from one side of the city to the other side of the city, and it is a service we should have, you know, free of charge. And there had been no consultation. So if you don't want to be in this kind of a situation, um, then involvement of civil society has to be upstream of course, but also during the elaboration of the PPP contract. And um, the, the, it, it is absolutely critical. I mean, user pay money or, you know, taxpayer money um, is your, your money and I'm, you know, my money. And, um, you know, we, we, we definitely want to have a say. And I think that, you know, the, clearly um, at the UNEC we've called our new PPPs, you know, people first, PPPs. Um, some people are, are adding PPP and people, so it's a 4P. Uh, and um, we, can, we can see that um, this is going to be mainstream. And um, I was just discussing this earlier. Uh, I remember the times when, um, you know, the Equator principles and, you know, the World Bank, for example, was insisting on new on, on new uh, environmental criteria um, to be met when um, the bank was to fund or co-fund, um, and you know the, the the finance community being up in arms and saying, oh, you know, it's going to be a, a, a higher cost. Well, clearly things have changed now. You know, the Ecuador principles are mainstream, and for me, SDG principles are going to be mainstream very, very shortly, and 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 in a in a in a in a most um, interesting way. And the, the reason I'm saying this is that I think there's a new take. I think there is a new, um, you know, sense of community. I think that uh, there's a new generation that is asking to do things differently. And um, the, the business community, certainly, and the governments cannot ignore this. Um, and I think that, you know, SDGs actually call for and allow for, you know, as we said, good governments, good governance, and you know, empirical evidence shows that, uh, you know, the success of PPPs and you know a number of projects of essential services is highly linked to, you know, the good governance, uh, whether it's as the framework, whether um, people understand the framework, where there's transparency, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, what I also think is happening, uh, and which we cannot ignore, is that new technology, the role of new technology, and certainly um, in the new urban agenda, when we talk about smart cities and grids and, you know, solar energy and new apps, the intelligent road, it's everywhere. And I think it's probably, uh, you are, as experts in this area, a lot more aware of what new technology is going to have as an impact, you know, on, on, uh, on, 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 on infrastructure and uh, the need for, uh, you know, the, the involvement, actually, of, of, of private sector. I think that, that, you know, if there is one suggestion is that the partnerships are probably also uh, a very interesting lever and tool to um, uh, ensure that new technology development, the new apps, the new, you know, be part of the picture, that the governments, um, you know, do, do support or invite, you know, a number of NGOs and CSOs and private sector to participate to this new challenge. Because the challenges of, you know, UN Habitat 3 and new cities are just, uh, you know, Incredible when I when I think is you know as Castano was saying the demographics, um, the size of the cities, the level of population within cities, um, the migration crisis. You know I come from Europe and this is we cannot ignore the impact that it has in settlements and also you know floods and natural catastrophes. I mean the challenges on um, urban planners and municipalities and local governments is immense and um, I think that you know obviously. 
uh, the more information is available, the more support and you know capacity building is a very you know is a word that is used all the time but I think support um, from experts and people who share this vision is, is, is really important anyways in my concluding um, remarks I would like to say that I think partnerships are providing the right mindset and you know approach to engage with all stakeholders in the context of you know sustainable um, smart cities or the new urban agenda. I think the term is not overused. Partnerships mean partnerships. You sit down, you talk, you try to understand, you know, where are the benefits, who has to, who will benefit most, the positive and the negatives. The word SGG is not a buzzword. It's here and for me it becomes it really becomes, oh, they are the right criteria, the right prism, the right angle of attack to engage in partnerships. If we are um, interested in engaging in partnerships, then we need a new grid. As I said, it's not the value for money. Leave it behind. It's not just a money issue. It is, you know, who, you know, will benefit. And, and, and when we are considering projects or a series of projects like, you know, urban planning, um, Obviously, the first question is, you know, why are we doing it, this project? Does it make sense? Who is it impacting? So it does, you know, if we combine partnerships with SDGs, then it forces all of us to actually think in terms of long-term planning as a priority. And interestingly enough, it pushes aside or it, it questions, it, it pushes us to question the um, the politicians um, um, you know timeline and agendas and I'll come back to that I said it forces all parties to have a consideration on the long-term impact of projects on people's lives and especially in urban areas it, it is you know your everyday life there's been a, an interesting um, initiative uh, in Paris in a small arrondissement where I live and uh, People have been asked, you know, where would you like, where do we need to, um, what would help you in, in you know, your daily uh, lives? And there have been, you know, every year now they're choosing a number of projects which are vetted, you know, by the local, sub-local, even at my, micro level. But it has changed um, the, the dynamics, um, you know, within the local population. People are very proud of, you know, some of their initiatives and the fact, and they keep an eye and they measure and, you know, anyway, it has a really positive impact and people feel consulted, in, you know, engaged uh, and, and, and motivated to continue to identify, you know, new projects for, um, you know, the local community's lives. As I said, you know, it forces us to look at who's impacted most, positive, negative, women, obviously, clearly women, major, um, you know, uh, agenda for me, um, gender, empowerment of women, uh, the impact on children and young people, you know, providing equal access, uh, absolutely critical. And it forces a new governance. Um, and as I said, you know, empirical evidence shows that good institutions and good regulations impact most, not money. Um, so, and this is not, you know, the MDBs or the, the private sector, it just forces, uh, it just forces us to concentrate on what is going to be the best framework in order to push forward, you know, essential services, small and medium-sized projects, you know, for the community. Um, and as I said also, it forces um, transparency and integrity uh, because if we are putting SDGs as the new investment criteria or decision criteria for our projects, then let's not forget that what's, what gets measured, i.e. against you know, this SDG criteria, gets reported. Gets measured, gets reported. And that is the best way of ensuring that you know, there is transparency, there is integrity, as you know, these projects are put to the to the front and to, to discussions. As I said, uh, for me, PPP and SDGs are really interesting because, as I said, the focus is on, uh, you know, what do we want for our future? It is an agenda for the longer term, and it is disconnecting, um, you know, these long-term projects, this urban new urban agenda with the political term agendas. 
And I think it's really interesting that we all see that the people are claiming new powers. And if you look at the election processes everywhere, it's changed. The world has changed and we need to incorporate that in our thinking. And it's changed you know, for the better in that, in that regard because it is really forcing us to look at things very differently. So CSOs, people, CSOs, NGOs, civil society have a new role and we should never forget that they are the ones who were the first to access new technology. Uh, technology apps, uh, which are very efficient, fantastic tools uh, for workers, people to report instantly about corruption, lack of transparency, um, technical issues, uh, environment, labor issues. And, you know, these tools are critical in a sort of a whistleblower kind of uh, way. And as I said, you know, it forces more transparency and integrity on all of us. It forces us to measure and justify, you know, the benefits uh, before we take on any of these challenges. And let's not forget that in a number of cases, uh, uh, CSO, civil society, has actually derailed a number of governments and derailed a number of projects, be they PPP or not, but they have. So, um, if I, if I may, I, I'd love to um, conclude, uh, you know, with um, the, the, your own, uh, the agenda that, um, sorry, your own, um, sorry about that, I wanted to read out uh, the, uh, sorry, it's here, you, your paragraph 121, sorry about this. Um, and it says, recognizes partnerships. The new urban agenda recognizes partnerships as a means of implementation. We recognize that it requires an enabling environment. And we've talked about that. A wide range of means of implementation, access to science, technology, innovation, enhanced knowledge and sh knowledge sharing, which is you know what we're beginning to do and which we need to continue to do. Mutually agreed terms, capacity development. We've talked about that. Mobilization of financial resources and here my message is um, money is available as long as we get it done and framed a certain way money is actually available for this tapping into all available traditional innovative sources at the global regional national subnational local levels and well as enhanced international cooperation so here we are and um, I think that I will leave it here and I'd be very happy to answer any questions that you may have, even challenging ones. Uh, I should have insisted um, and said that not all PPPs have been successful, far from it, uh, but I'm happy to share more um, and happy to continue this discussion. Thank you very much. On behalf of the Ministry of Urban Development and Housing of Ecuador and the United Nations Institute for Training and Research, UNITAR, we would like to thank you, Dr. Karin Namlard, for sharing your expertise and your contribution to the ongoing discussions on Habitat 3. Thank you very much. Now to our attendees, a short survey will appear on your screen at this moment. Please, if you can just answer it briefly, it will be just one question whether uh, this seminar was helpful to you or not. Um, and then we'll continue with the Q&A. For the Q&A section, uh, please, in the questions section on the right column, uh, you can ask your question, and I'll read it to Dr. Namblard, um, who will be able to answer it until 11 Ecuador time. So now we're just waiting for everybody to vote. Sure. I think mm -hmm. most of the people are, <laughs> are answering the, the survey, and then we'll continue. I have to tell you, this is the very, very first time I've ever done this, so it's a it's a first, so thank you very much for your patience. <laughs> <laughs> it has been a great presentation, Dr. Nalar, thank you very much. No, it's been a pleasure, thank you. It's it's a difficult subject, um, so you know, you don't, you, you want to try to capture uh, the trends, because that's what I was really trying to do. Um, obviously, you know, we, we could have a, a much more technical presentation, but I think it would be very boring at this point in time. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have a, 
some questions, Dr. Inamblad, if that is okay? Um, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, we would, I think Sofia Pesantes uh, is asking if uh, for some examples of PPPs that have been successful uh, for urban development? I don't know. Uh, look, like this right top of my head, um, I, I, I don't have any in particular right now. I'm very sorry. Uh, I'll get back to you on that one. Is that okay? I just really want to be able to... Um, uh, I know of, you know, I, I know of... Um, roads and uh, lighting and, um, you know, uh, mass transit, uh, yeah, I, yes, there are a number, number of projects, but I'm happy to provide a list of interesting projects. I would say old norm and new norm. You see what I'm trying to say? Yes. Okay, perfect. We can go with an another question. Um, what is what is the main reason of the more expensive cost of the public private partnership against the public okay as i briefly said if um the project is it and it depends you know what kind of um ppp we have but in a ppp where the funding of the construction of the project, for example, is in the hands or has is is at is the responsibility of the private sector. If the private sector goes to the financial market, i.e. goes to the bank or raises fund in the market, it will be more expensive than if, for example, the government of Ecuador goes to the market. You see what I'm trying to say? The cost of the government of Ecuador who has a much better rating um, you know, goes to its banks or its um, at the market to fund a project, there will be a spread of a number of points which will make the project more expensive. Okay, so that is the, the main reason. It's the cost of funding. The cost of construction or the cost of operating is sometimes less when it is done by the private sector. Different techniques, uh, different ways of operating, you see what I mean? Um, for example, water treatment uh, can be less expensive if it is managed by the private sector uh, than by the public sector because the public sector will have different um, you know, ways of doing it, uh, hiring people, um, cost structures, etc. So I, I'm giving you the main reason is actually comes with the funding upstream, okay? Perfect. Thank you very much, Dr. Nambler. We have another question from Ms. Mariana Cadena. Uh, she asks, how can we improve the PPP transparency and which strategies will be adopted for successful PPPs for both state and private sector? Mm -hmm. Uh, look, the transparency and integrity issue is actually quite key. Um, I think that it is the strongest message that uh, you know the private and the public sector can send uh, when they both embrace transparency and integrity rules um, under a PPP scheme. We're currently working on this. Um, at the UNEC with a group of worldwide experts, people coming from the private sector and from the public sector. And we have tried to identify um, the 10 most important um, issues uh, when, uh, for example, the private sector and the public sector negotiate. Um, and it's, it's on both sides. I mean, you know, the, the, the corruption or unethical behavior is not just on the private sector side. It is also taking place on the public side. Um, when, you know, there are extortion or pressures or constant conflict of interest. So the team, and I, I've been part of this um, over the past year, has been working on identifying where are the problem areas? What are the issues? And we have tried to come up with 10 most important issues. Um, we are 
finalising right now the standard, um, this document, which is going to be made available on the UN ECU website very shortly for public consultation. So um, I would like to invite you, and I will, you know, let UNITAR know about when this document is going to be available. I would say probably within two weeks or so. Um, but I invite you to actually connect to the UNEC website and have a look at the standard and comment because we will really welcome receiving um, comments. Now, uh, there are also, and you will see that in this document, there are cross-references to other research being done by the OECD, the World Bank, uh, Transparency International, etc. So if you're doing a bit of research, this will help also focus on uh, the outcomes, the recommendations. There has been an interesting trend, if I may say so, to ask the last, the la later part of the question of um, this, uh, this, this lady, is, um, is the fact that there is a debate right now in the international community about whether we should keep, you know, um, a very uh, a strong focus on, uh, you know, penalties and, um, you know, uh, legal re you know, recourse versus a positive capacity building, i.e. encouraging governments to acknowledge the fact that, yes, there has been corrupt behavior uh, and it needs to be dealt with, and yes, there will be a culture of transparency and integrity um, being developed, you know, within administrations and governments and so forth. Um, so there is a, a debate as to, um, it's a combination probably of both, you know, to bringing in a culture of, you know, more ethical behavior. Uh, for example, it's really interesting to see that, um, and in Europe as well, and don't get me wrong, I mean, the cost of corruption is to the tune of billions, and so it's a real issue. But, you know, one of the most prevailing forms of unethical behavior is conflict of interest. Uh, people don't always understand that because they have the information, etc. It, it is, you know, a conflict of interest, and and that you have to and you need to behave a certain way in order to avoid, you know, situations where you are conflicted de facto. So I think it's again, this, this is probably the subject of another, um, you know, webinar. Um, is is um, you know how do you how do you um, identify, you know, and define an ethical behavior? And you know whether you are in the private and, 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 and public sector, we are recommending that there is a code of ethics um, that is proposed as part of the tendering uh, of a, uh, a PPP procurement, and that both the private sector and the public sector sign that code of conduct and adhere to it. So, so again, you know, uh, a balanced approach. We're all parties in this, and we should, you know, embrace it. So that's my, you know, response for now on this one. Thank you, Dr. Namlard. Um, we can just then win with one last question. Uh, thank you, everyone, for all the questions we have. Sadly, because of the time constraint, we will only be able to answer one more. And this is from Galo Maldonado, who um, thanks you, Dr. Corinne, um, for an interesting conference. Thank and you then very he much. asks, um, what do you think about PPPs on Latin America? Uh, alors, uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm not, I'm not, you know, an expert per se, but I think there have been some very interesting uh, um, developments, um, and uh, I would like also to suggest that you look up um, the UNECE website and you look for a document which is a compendium of People First PPPs. The compendium is a list of uh, projects around the world which are have a form of private public partnership and who have who are supporting one or more of the SDGs okay and there is one that is quite remarkable which is called uh, Luz para todos and it's in Brazil and it is, uh, you know, under a PPP scheme, how, um, you know, power and obviously light has been brought to certain parts of, um, of, uh, of, of Brazil. 
and how this, the impact, the very profound impact it has had on populations. Um, you know, children being able to study, uh, you know, for school at night, uh, people able to, you know, save food that they have cooked, you know, um, and, and, and a number of other uh, of these, um, of these, uh, these, these SDG type of impacts that I was mentioning. But, uh, there have been a lot. There have been a lot more. Uh, some have been, you know, hotly contested. Uh, Aguas Argentina, um, you know, with various. Uh, uh, how can I say? Um, developments in terms of ideology, as I as I said earlier, uh, a desire, you know, of a of a new government to re renationalize, you know, uh, projects that had been done under PVPs. Uh, for uh, reasons or motives such as, you know, the private sector is making way too much money uh, over this. So, yes, there have been positive and less positive examples in Latin America, but there are a number of projects in Latin America. Um, you know, it, when I will write up uh, my report, I can, I can add um, a few examples, but please do go to the UNEC website. Thank you very much, Dr. Corinne Namblard. On behalf of the Ministry of Urban Development and Housing of Ecuador and the United Nations Institute of Training and Research Unitar, we would like to thank you, Dr. Namblard, and thank uh, all our attendees uh, that assisted this webinar on public-private partnerships for sustainable development. Uh, you will be receiving your certificates of participation via email during the week. Um, also, on your screen you can see our social media. We invite you to follow us and visit our webpage with all updated information regarding Habitat 3, logistics organization, and also um, all the previous webinars that have been given. We also like to invite all of our attendees for tomorrow. We'll have the last webinar on um, from vision to reality, challenges for the implementation of the new urban agenda, which will, will be given in Spanish by expert Barbara Schultz at the same time, 10 a.m. Ecuador time. And you can register at our webpage or at UNITAR's webpage, uh, the, same, the same as was done for this webinar. Uh, we just wanted to remind you all that the registration for Habitat 3 is open and it will close on October 1st. So you can all uh, register free of charge at um, the UN webpage, habitat3.org. Uh, thank you, everyone, and good evening or good day, depending on where in the world you are. And thank you, Dr. Namblard, again. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.